Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsors, Distributed Bio and Cartera, I'd like to welcome you to accelerate your antibody discovery with high throughput kinetic screening of phage libraries. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'll be the host and the moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Jacob Glanville, PhD, co-founder and chief science officer of Distributed Bio. And our second presenter is Yasmina Nubia Abdish, PhD, Chief Science Officer for Cartera. Welcome, Jacob and Yasmina. Jacob, the presenter ball is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth, for coordinating the, the webinar. And thank you, Cartera team, for inviting me here to share some of our work today. I'll be spending a bit of time talking about our efforts to apply computational immunology to optimize antibody discovery. This is a bit of a paradigm shift where our goal, instead of identifying antibody hits and then spending a bunch of time trying to correct them and optimize them, is to apply deep computational methods up front to design libraries that have all the hits you'd need and you can apply selection uh, and filtering uh, rather than engineering. In order to do this, we ran into a problem of a victim of our own success where we had a huge number of hits against each skinny antigen tested and the Cartera LSA platform really came to the rescue for us in being able to screen the vast numbers of hits we were recovering from the library very quickly. And that's the story I'll be sharing with you today. So my interest in this work really started in 2008 when I was comparing the amount of time it took us at the bench to do in vitro discovery and optimization of antibodies, typically nine to 12 months from initial lead discovery to optimization to the amount of time it took in vivo, with the particularly impressive system being our own bodies that could go from a small infection to responding antibodies within seven days. And that always made me feel that our technologies were, uh, were deficient compared to the fully optimized state um, of our evolved uh, living systems, uh, 642 million years of evolution. And it made me think that we, could, we should be able to get closer to that seven-day goal by applying computational methods and, and things that we'd learned along the way on engineering antibodies effectively to produce libraries where most of the work had been uh, accomplished in advance through the design and it could be avoided um, downstream. So you could just screen molecules that were ready to go and you don't have to fuss about trying to correct them. So at the time, in around 2008, this was the, the collection of major technologies you one could use to generate antibodies. You have hybridoma, traditional phage, and then the emergence of transgenic animals that are producing human antibodies. And I've made a point, uh, an effort to map out roughly how long the development timelines take from discovering a hit, either through immunization, hybridoma generation, or phage panning, and then subsequently to make that hit high enough affinity to be in the functional range that one is interested in, maybe make it cross-reactive to the species one would like to be able to run animal studies in, make it more thermostable, remove liabilities, and so forth. And in general, you can see that the additional time taken by immunizations are compensated by having higher affinity molecules downstream. With hybridoma, there's a bunch of extra time taken for humanization and then optimization of the molecule that you don't need to do with a transgenic animal. Even then, some work is necessary to make those molecules therapeutic ready. What I'll be describing today, the consequence of the last nine years of work, is a new paradigm where we, within two months, can go from taking an antigen, panning it, and then by combining our ability to rapidly pan and produce a very large number of hits, 5,000 to 9,000 against the target, with the Cartera LSA platform's ability to high throughput kinetic screen those hits, uh, radically changes the, the, the speed with which we're performing this kind of development. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about a seven-day discovery cycle. Um, and that's something we're very excited about. And it's really only made possible because of these advances in the computational immunology of the libraries uh, combined with the ability to perform rapid kinetic screens. This work really was made possible due to the advent of high throughput sequencing. Starting in 2009, I, it became possible for me to high throughput sequence a library to figure out what diversity was present and then high throughput sequence a very large number of hits against a large panel of antigens. And that gave me the ability to understand 
what parts of our libraries were being successful and what parts were failing against Scriven antigens. What you're seeing here is the progress, the iterative improvement of libraries, four of them built between 2009 and 2013, all panned against the same antigen. This is PCSK9, and you're seeing the nanomolar affinities shown there on the y-axis. What you can see is that the, the work helped, that each iterative library resulted in more hits and higher affinity hits over time. Um, some of that work has been published and it's referred to at the bottom. And what I'll be talking about today is the, the final conclusion of that work, and that's the distributed bio superhuman library. I'll talk a little bit about the engineering decisions that went into it, the strategy to optimize the diversity of the CDRs to be able to produce what we're getting now, about 5,000 hits against every uh, target panned, including about 300 unique picomolar hits. Um, that's a number we've been able to discover through the use of the Cartera technology. Uh, and then also a bit of, about how we try to encode the developability up front, so you don't have to spend time engineering every molecule that comes out. They're ready to go as therapeutics. I'll start with describing the scaffold selection. Um, the original libraries I worked with used the whole natural library repertoire, so 70 different VH family scaffolds and germline scaffolds, uh, and about 70 V kappa and V lambda scaffolds. For this library, I wanted to remove most of them because many scaffolds that are found in the human repertoire make terrible choices as drugs. And you can see that at the bottom, a couple examples of B genes that I just would never want to build a drug on. Things like 4 34 that have inherently terrible half-life because they are inherently autoreactive to red blood cells and lymphocytes. Things like IGHB 2 5 that are inherently uh, unstable. They're difficult to uh, create a stable therapeutic that you can concentrate and it is uh, not immunogenic as a consequence of creating aggregates. And then there's things like IGHV4-B, a B gene that's only found in about half of humans. If you build a drug on that, it will appear non-human in the other half of subjects, so you would never want to do that. There are B genes like IGLV6-57 that are aggregation prone, and the list goes on. In the end, I decided I didn't want most of those 3,500 combinations of B genes. I wanted B genes that satisfied six different criteria. They should have been able to have already been put in a human by someone else, so phase one plus, I wanted them to be as non-immunogenic as possible, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. I wanted them to be aggregation resistant. I wanted them to be able to display well on phage. It doesn't help me if they're good B genes, but they don't display well on phage if I'm using phage display libraries. They just will not be unproductive in creating binders. I wanted them to be thermostable because it influences expression, the ability to concentrate the, the drug, and the resistance to anti-drug antibodies as a consequence of uh, avoiding misfolding that is more easily captured and presented by the immune system. And finally, I wanted some canonical structural diversity. I didn't just want one scaffold, because every effort to create a library based on one scaffold has a notable side effect that certain epitopes are heavily favored by that scaffold and other epitopes are neglected. I wanted to make sure that I could target any epitope. Briefly, here's the kinds of data that we use to generate that Venn diagram and make our ultimate selections. This is a summary of about 400 therapeutics that have made it into phase one plus trials. You notice that certain V genes are heavily biased. I've highlighted the, the four V genes that we've ultimately chosen for the heavy chain and light chain in, in blue at the bottom. So you can see that there's some V genes that really dominate therapeutic development. They've gone into humans over and over again and, and no one's observed a problem. I never wanted to build any drug on a scaffold that hadn't been tested in human or had gone into human and, and there'd been problems with the half-life. Second, I took advantage of my published work and others work, other works and some unpublished data to identify V genes that we know can productively fold up and recognize uh, their cognate antigens when displayed on phage. So I don't want to use a V gene that if it's in a library but you never see hits coming out of that V gene, that, that implies that that is um, having trouble folding up in E. coli or displaying effectively on phage. Either way, I don't want it. I took advantage of the 1,000 Genomes Project data to make sure that the V genes I chose had a single dominant allele in all human populations. I wanted to avoid variation in the frameworks that might make my drug look more human in one ethnographic group, accidentally making it effectively a racist medicine. Or any population might have heterogeneity of alleles, uh, at a, uh, in which case there, every population would have a homozygote of the other allele where your drug would look more or less human depending on the subject. I wanted to avoid that problem, and we could easily do that by taking advantage of the 1,000 Genomes Project data. I used some aggregation database data to identify certain V genes that I wanted to avoid because they're overrepresented in V genes that are known to aggregate. I used thermostability data like 
most people that are working on synthetic and natural libraries to select VG and families that we know just are inherently more thermostable to begin with. So we're not having to fight an uphill battle on making these molecules therapeutic ready. And as a result of that selection, I came up with four VG uh, heavy chain frameworks and four VG and light chain frameworks shown here. With the final criteria being that I wanted different canonical topologies for their CDRs, so that there's different shapes of the paratope, and therefore it's more effectively able to target multiple epitopes. This is just a quick summary for the heavy chain. You can see there's a, in each case, many drugs that have reached the point that they've been named um, for each scaffold are available. And you notice there's a bias. There are more of 3-23 and HB 1-46 and relatively less of 169 and 3-15. And a similar story can be told for the light chain. I chose all kappa rather than lambda for a number of reasons that we can talk about offline. And you notice that again, KV1-39 is the most dominantly utilized in pre-existing therapeutics or drugs in phase trials. Since there are certain V genes that are heavily favored, I built the library to favor those as well. So that the library, rather than being even, even combination of all 16 different sub, uh, sub pools, it is overrepresented for IGHV 1-46 KV-139 and 3-23 KV-139. And the idea here is to treat it like a stock portfolio, that if I can get a hit from those two best-in-class combinations of scaffolds, I'd like to work with them. But if those two are not good at targeting my epitope of interest, I want to cover my butt by having the other 14 combinations available. And, and this balance ensures that we can target any epitope, and when possible, we use our favorite uh, scaffold combinations to be able to go as a therapeutic lead. So that's scaffold development, but you can have the best scaffolds in the world, and it's not really going to help you much if you don't have optimal CDR composition. And that's really the real advantage of our platform is that we think we've solved the problem of redundancy and non-functionality and that plagues most antibody discovery libraries. And it's really why we had to start working with Sartera to solve these sorts of problems and why we're so uh, glad that their technology has been online. So I'll talk a bit about what we did for diversity optimization of the CDRs. Um, Starting in 2009, it became pretty obvious when we started sequencing natural antibody libraries that there was a huge amount of redundancy in those libraries. So even though people claimed they could be e to the 10 in size, and in fact, they were more like e to the 7, and that's because when we seek deep sequence them, we found there were many clones that were very high frequency, so they were taking up a lot of space in the library, and that redundancy limited the total library effective functional size. And what was going on here is that if you take the blood from an individual, we know that we have about 10 to the 11 B cells in an adult. But if I sequence the, the PBMCs, the peripheral blood, you really only see about 10 million unique naive clones in circulating periphery and about E to the 5 memory clones. And those memory clones end up producing more RNA and there's more cells with the same clone. So they end up, the relatively few clones end up dominating a peripheral blood contribution from an individual subject. And that's catastrophic when you, even if you take hundreds of subjects, there's a limited number of clones that end up taking over a lot of that library. We've, we and others attempted to use synthetic methods instead to try to get around this, to use a synthesis by like, creating combinations of codon. In this case, this was an effort to make a library where each position in CDR had an equal opportunity of having all 20 possible, well, 19 amino acids. We excluded cysteine. And this turns out to be a pretty bad idea as well. Because when we compared the library design of that equal amino acid dispersion in each position to the kinds of hits we were getting out of such a library, we would find that the hits just never had certain amino acids that were built into the library at certain positions. In particular, there were stem positions that were facing inwards towards the rest of the structure. Therefore, there was more structural constraint on those positions. And that's pretty bad, because imagine we tried to put proline in at 5% at position 94 or 95, but proline, if you put it there, the, the antibody can no longer fold up effectively. What you've just done is you destroyed 5% of your li library at one position with one amino acid at low frequency. And you're not wrong once, you're wrong many times during these designs, and that means that your library, again, if you run the math, is about a thousand of the size you think it is, and that's mostly because it's no longer a redundancy, it's because of low fitness of many of the molecules. And this has been, a, I think, a problem observed by many, sub, many groups that have worked with synthetic libraries, and that so the library performs worse than it should, and the hits that come out sometimes have odd biophysical characteristic issues. This is just summarizing how bad that problem is. This is showing if you're 95% correct in all the amino acids you've encoded in a synthetic library, your library still, across all the CDRs, will be about a tenth of the size you think it is. But you're not 95% correct. So if we look over to the right, in log scale, say you're 90% correct, your library is about the hundredth of the size you think it is. And you can't afford to do 
you can't afford to get a B in synthetic library design because then your library ends up being like a thousandth of the size you think it is. So we made some efforts to go around that work back in 2011. We thought, aha, why don't we deep sequence the natural repertoires of humans and other species and learn from them the fitness landscape elected by evolutionary forces, which amino acids are tolerated at which positions in CDRs. Um, shown at the bottom is the Zimlin plot distribution of amino acids in CDRH3 from human to mouse. And you notice that there's a remarkable convergence of amino acid preferences that allow an antibody to fold up. And our thinking was, all right, let's use that distribution to make a synthetic library that only chooses the amino acids found in nature and roughly the frequency of amino acids per position found in nature. And that helps. It produced better, better molecules and higher affinity hits as in that progression I showed at the beginning of the talk. But it still resulted in molecules that had odd biophysical characteristics because the body had never weeded out things with four char positive charges in a row or a bunch of a small hydrophobic residues in a row or odd things that the body uh, really would have rejected, but in vitro we end up selecting for accidentally. And that really brought me a distributed bio back to the drawing board. And I thought, what I really want is to take advantage of those CDRs that have been selected by nature. They're less immunogenic. They've been pre-filtered for all sorts of nonsense that might be generically sticky. I just need to overcome that redundancy problem. And so we sequenced a bunch of twins and strangers to try to figure out how much diversity is there in the naive and the memory compartment? How much diversity is there across individuals? So how many people should I gather together to get appropriate diversity? How much can I enrich diversity by sort of separating the naive from the memory? And how much blood should I get per subject? And what we ended up getting is about 140 subjects we fax and max sorted their naive repertoire that's about 100 times more diverse than the memory repertoire, but it doesn't contain any somatic hypermutation. From that IgG memory repertoire that is much less diverse, but it has all that great mutations in the H1 and H2, L1 and L2. We took all that, that blood, we amplified the H3s produced by 140 subjects um, from the naive repertoire where that's more diverse and flat distribution. And then we, with specific primers that would amplify out just the CDRs from the frameworks we cared about, we amplified out the H1, H2, L1, L2, and L3 from the memory repertoire, combining VDJ recombination from humanity with somatic hypermutation from humanity on those specific frameworks. Uh, we then combined that stuff using uh, entirely synthetic frameworks. So I didn't want any mutations in my frameworks. I wanted variation just in the CDRs, and I wanted fixed frameworks just on those uh, 16 scaffold combinations I described previously. Our assembly process ends up multiplying the diversity, which is really great because it means I can take 140 donors and I end up with a library after the multiplication process that's equivalent of about 35,000 donors contributing. But I don't have to deal with that much blood. Uh, we checked the assembly process using high throughput sequencing at every step to make sure that our PCR uh, overlap extension wasn't causing weird aberration in the, the composition of the CDR combinations. And that ultimately resulted in a VK diversity that's about 100 times more diverse than you'd find in a natural library. And a VH, comp, a VH diversity that's about 2,000 times more diverse than what's found in nature, even though we've restricted ourselves to only 16 scaffold combinations out of 3,500 possible. During that process, there was another cute trick we were able to do, and that is that biochemical liabilities exist at a certain rate in the natural repertoire. You have deamination sites, acid hydrolysis sites, and leak acosylation sites, free cysteines, and so forth. All these irritating bugaboos that you have to go in and fix on your therapeutic. Um, be, to, for, to ensure stability of formulation. Um, because we had 140 subjects and we had easy access to deep sequencing, what we did is we checked every subject. We sequenced every subject's diversity contribution from every CDR, and we noticed that certain subjects had an enrichment of, say, free cysteines on a dominant clone in their H1 of 3-23. So we picked that subject out. We were able to um, carefully exclude some specific subjects that had an elevated rate of certain liabilities. And that means that our library, even though it's composed of diversity from nature, is actually got way less liabilities than it's found in nature and has the benefit of the most complex reduction of liability, and that's that the fitness of the CDRs is really good because it's been elected by human bodies as being tolerable. We did a final check when we were building it so that we can do as much work as possible upstream to make sure that diversity is, is as robust as possible. But I, whenever possible, I like to do selection pressures in vitro as well. So what we did is we built our library with a light chain first. We drop in about 100 million different versions of each of our four scaffolds of light chain, and we put it in with a single fixed heavy chain, the 3-23 germline with a, a pretty consensus looking CDRH3. We then attempt to uh, rescue, to express all of those antibodies on the surface of phage, 
we heat stress them to 65 Celsius, and then we pull down only the ones that had successfully expressed and hadn't fallen, hadn't fallen apart under 65 Celsius heat pressure. And that resulted in us grabbing about the top 10% of all the light chains, which was still about 10 million different light chains for each one of the, the frameworks. But what's really cool about this is that now every, almost every one of our light chains in our library is thermostable, expresses well in E. coli, and functionally active. And then that's the diversity we drop our heavy chains into. And this has the result of producing a library that ultimately with 7.6 e to the 10, including the heavy chains, when we drop them, or number of transformants, where each one of those heavy chains is associated with an excellent expression partner. And that increases the overall expression and thermostability of the entire library. This is just a little eye candy showing what those hits look like. So you can see there's almost no mutations uh, anywhere in the frameworks. So you don't have to do any framework reversion. And the diversity in the CDRs is shown in the, the white there is enriched from what is produced in, in humans. So this is natural diversity in the CDRs, entirely germline in the frameworks, thermostabilized and expression selected on the light chain prior to assembly. So we thought that was pretty cool. We started deep sequencing it. And then we started to run large numbers of screens. And I'll talk about that work and how we collaborated or how we've been able to take advantage of the technology with Cartera to enable uh, us to start high throughput characterizing the hits coming out of the library. So the first thing we did is we deep sequenced our library and compared it to previous published libraries. The Renat library I published in, the, uh, in PNAS in 2009, and then a naive and a memory repertoire. And what you're looking at here is basically it's saying if you rank the clones in a library, by their frequency, you can ask the top 10 or the top 100, top 1,000, top 10,000 clones, how much of the total library is that? What you can see is for typical natural libraries, like shown in green, the PNAS library from 2009, the top 10,000 clones represent about 70% of everything in that library. So even though you claim you have 3.2 times e to the 10 transformants, almost all of those transformants are occupied by a limited number of clones. And that's catastrophic towards the total diversity of that library. That's that redundancy crisis I was telling you about. And that's pretty, you see that naive is better than memory, but both libraries have those sorts of problems. Whereas uh, the superhuman that we built is an entirely different paradigm. You see even in the top 100,000 most dominant clones represent less than 2% of that entire library. So we're actually finally taking advantage of the diversity of transformants in library construction. When we do just direct overlaps, we sequence the library about 4 million reads deep twice, we found 99.93% of all clones to be unique on the heavy chain, and we see about 95% unique on the light chain when we do about a million reads each. So the light chain is inherently less diverse than the heavy chain, but both of these numbers are ridiculously nice compared to what is typical of natural and even previous synthetic methods. So we started panning it. Our first panning was against beta-gal. So we just took beta-gal on beads, biotinylated, panned it three rounds uh, in replicate, so independent pannings for three rounds, and then we characterize one plate by Eliza from the panning group A and then one plate by panning group B. And then this cursory test of two plates, we found 20 positives in the first uh, panning group and 41 in the second panning group. When we sequenced them, those 61 hits, we found 49 of them to be unique and there was only one shared clone across the two. And what this told us was that we are getting lots of unique diversity and that screening two plates wouldn't even come close to covering all the unique hits in the library. And we needed to use a different technology to end up really after answering the question, how many hits do we actually have in this library? How many plates would it be worth screening in order to get exhaustive coverage of all the hits? And so to do that, we turned to our Genesis platform. This is a web-based, Amazon Cloud-driven, high-throughput sequencing and Sanger sequencing integrated system for, for looking at millions of antibodies and integrating functional data along with sequence data. We can use it in a primer set that we have in-house to look at multiple rounds of selection very easily in our library. And we did that. What you're seeing here are some of the example antigens that we panned in the first set of experiments. So it's growth hormone receptor, again, panned and replicate. PD-1 panned and replicate, both of those are FC fusions. Uh, we also had biotinylated glucagon and biotinylated betagal, and then histagged transferrin and histagged human growth hormone. Um, these were all panned on beads. Uh, on the Kingfisher platform, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So what you're looking at here is a log scale. Uh, each little red dot represents a clone, uh, and you see the clone distribution is going to down to like one in 10,000 events of enrichment. So we deep sequenced all of these uh, different selections, and then we're comparing against each other. And the, the main takeaways from this figure are that the replicates 
most of the hits we come up mutually are coming up above replicates. So you, the two to independent pannings of growth hormone receptor find a large number of growth hormone receptor hits, about uh, 8,500 for growth hormone receptor, 6,500 for PD-1, and so forth. At least 5,000 hits against every antigen we've tested. Most of them only ever show up in the replicates and nowhere else, but we do see some cases of uh, some clones that are emerging on streptavidin uh, beads, so we think they're anti-strep hits, or some clones that show up at a lower frequency when you're doing nickel uh, on nickel beads that they have enrichment of positive charges. So that was pretty helpful for us because it lets us computationally pick a clone, check to make sure it didn't show up under any other selection or that the database hasn't already registered as being, we think this is a nickel binder, we think this is an FC binder, and so forth, uh, and, and also optimize our, our deselections. So this was pretty cool, and it, it put us in a very different position where we said, well, if you have 6,500 different PD-1 hits, then you should, first off, you run into a screening crisis. How the hell am I going to go in and, and characterize all of those hits? I wanted something faster and more powerful than ELISA. I really wanted kinetics. I wanted to be able to identify uh, different epitope bins very quickly, figure out cross-reactive members. Our strategy was if there's 6,500 different unique PD-1 hits, then surely we have PD-1 hits like no one else has that crosses from human to cyano to mouse. I might want to pick things that are agonists or antagonists. Uh, those sorts of criteria where I, I need a faster screening technology. Uh, and to do that, we turn to the Cartera platform. Uh, so the LSA, hear more about the technicals in a second from Yasmina, but from my perspective, it was an amazing platform where I could get my panning rounds. I can, it, it's able to operate on a very low concentration of input analyte or, uh, or the antibody and the ligand. And it's able to operate on 384 well format, which was great for me because I could go take a selection from PD-1, as I'm about to show you. We'd pick plates of colonies, induce per, uh, PPE, periplasmic extract, overnight, and then they would be able to run it in a day to be able to get kinetics on hundreds of clones, thousands of clones, potentially. Uh, that's really a radical improvement over what I need to do uh, to process uh, through, say, reformatting a bunch of clones or increasing the scale of culture in order to be able to operate on some of the other less sensitive instruments or other BLI or SPR instruments that just have a way lower throughput. This is an example of some of the data we took from our PD-1 selections. Now, this is a primary screen. There was no ELISA done up front. We basically just don't do ELISAs anymore. We go directly to kinetics. Um, this is the first plate, uh, gray or negative, negative clones. Um, otherwise, you're seeing syncytograms emerge. This is the second plate. And this gave us the ability to, in our library, immediately get kinetic information of hundreds of hits and to understand the distribution of the kinds of affinities we were generating from this library. Um, so this is a summary histogram of that, our affinities. And what we're finding is about 7% of our, our hits were sub-nanomolar. Uh, and some of them were reaching the, the lower threshold, about 500 picomolar that we could assert from the assay. Um, and that was great because it gave us a ranked list right away. We knew we were getting hits. We knew what our distribution was. And we could pick the ones that have the best affinities or off rates or, or, or a range that we're interested in uh, within a 24-hour period directly from the panning. So that was very exciting for us. Uh, you see some of the instagrams displayed down below. Um, one of the cool things it also lets us do is we can go in and look for an affinity maturation of a particular clone and understand, okay, what's the relationship between sets of residues that vary across similar, similar versions of the same clone and their kinetics? This, so that's, that's pretty powerful because those sorts of questions I've always liked ans answering. We have really good computational methods to do sequence activity relationship analysis. But it was just a pain to do on previous SPR instruments. And the nature of our library is that sometimes you get this for free. So you'll have a dominant hit, like the one there shown at the top, that's against beta gal. And if you look in the deep sequencing data, you'll find multiple versions of that molecule um, also enriching. And that's because that given H3 occurred at a higher frequency than the total library diversity. So multiple H1 and H2s were associated with it. In effect, we got a free affinity maturation, a little mini affinity maturation, and a little bit of information about which residues were important for the high affinity of that molecule when it emerged. Beyond just being able to do rapid kinetics, which already is super valuable, we are able to use the platform to ask very quickly for our PD-1 hits, for instance, which ones are, we can ask which ones are cross-reactive from human to cyano and even to mouse. And we can start asking complex questions about uh, specific epitope bins. So in the case of our growth hormone receptor uh, panning, which was very successful, we got almost 8,500 unique hits in that case. Uh, we screened a number of them, and we found blockers, non-blockers, and then Yasmina's team ended up helping us discover 
Um, some really interesting cases of some antibodies that appear to be able to selectively dislodge the ligand even when it's already bound. So this gives you an ability to search for where is my, my hit landing. I want to find a, a binder that blocks the ligand, or I want to find a binder that doesn't block the competitor's uh, therapeutic epitope. Or in this case, I want to find unique molecules with unique powers. And that's really the paradigm shift. If you have 20 hits coming out of a panning, you're just look, hoping one of them is functionally active. But if you have 6,000 or 8,000 hits coming out of a panning, then you're going to start looking for unique functions. You can become more creatively aggressive at trying to find molecules that have unique properties, like an ability to displace a ligand which is already bound uh, at, at the receptor. So we're very excited about that. And we're still trying to come up with new ways we can leverage the technology to take advantage of that sort of high throughput functional screen of kinetic properties. So that's essentially the summary here, right? We've gone from these more than a year discovery times down to about two months where we do ultra fast screening, get a bunch of uh, ultra fast selections, and then ultra fast screening on the Kotera platform. And you end up with molecules that don't have all that, that work ahead of correcting the frameworks, thermostabilizing, removing mutations, increasing affinity and, and the CDRs and creating cross reactivity. You solve all of that in the new paradigm by having so many hits that you just apply additional selection pressure. So you pan against the human version, then the cyano version, then the mouse version, you apply heat between the rounds, and you end up with the, the kind of molecule you're looking for, not because you spent a year engineering it, but because it was always there from the beginning and you're just selecting it out and you need it and tools very quickly to characterize. I'll talk for a minute about the, where we think this is going, and that's this superhuman zero day, or a seven day discovery cycle. I mean, I kind of say this to get people's attention, but it really is something we, we are doing now. And the, the way we're getting a seven-day discovery cycle is that once we realized that this library could produce so many hits against each antigen, we just began industrializing the process. So we picked every immune oncology target, or many of them. They're shown there on the left. Um, we pan them all on magnetic feeds using the kingfishers that are shown on the right. And then we deep sequence the pool so we know how many hits are available and we know the pannings were successful. At that point, we bank them in the fridge or the freezer, and we have uh, groups coming to us and saying, hey, I'd actually really like to have a Tidget or a Vista hit, or I would like to have something, you know, an agonist or an antagonist or something that doesn't block a certain epitope. And then rather than working nine months with a CRO or internally to see if they get hits of that type, we say, well, we already know we have 5,000 hits of that class. You can just search through the pool. We've already de-risked the time and the, the success for you, and now you can just search through our collection of existing hits, and we can partner on those molecules. You can have them. And that works like this. They come to us. Day one, we take that out of the fridge, uh, the freezer. We plate those clones. We have an agreed number of clones they want to look at. So it could be, you know, we could look at four plates, 20 plates, whatever. Uh, day two, we have colonies. By day three, we have PPE. Uh, by day four, Cartera, Cartera kinetics data. And then from the kinetics data, that quickly winnows down a collection of molecules that are of interest because of certain epitopes or certain cross-reactivities. And those are the ones that end up being characterized further. So it's a super powerful seven-day discovery cycle because we've, we have a library that's good enough that we can run it all up front, and we have a screening technology that's powerful enough to be able to screen hundreds of hits, giving you powerful kinetic data right out of the gate. So I'm almost done. That's the main way that we're using the technology right now. I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about kind of ways we're excited to keep using Cartera going forward. One of them I alluded to a little bit is in affinity maturation. So we have a technology called Tumblr that enables us to take a hit, and let's say I want to make it pH sensitive, so it releases its cargo in the endosome pathway, or I want it to bind conditionally in the presence of a secondary ligand, or do some other enhanced engineering. Uh, we have a technology that lets us very quickly take a molecule and produce about 500 near-starting molecule variants. So it effectively explores all single, double, triple, quadruple affinity maturation variants. So that's great. Uh, but at a certain point after the screening process, that library's got a lot of positives in it, and there's going to be a lot of subtle amino acid changes, and you'd like to be able to get a lot of kinetic information quickly across all of those. And so we've already done a couple of great programs using the Cartera technology that have given us the ability to have kinetic data for hundreds of versions of a starting molecule. So we can get a range of affinities if someone's trying to, say, assess what the optimal affinity is in vitro or in vivo for a molecule, or we can explore sequence activity relationships that quickly teach us which residues and which combinations of residues are giving rise to these new desirable characteristic features. And the, the platform is really great for that because it's not hard to get 384 data points. You can, you can do that multiple times very quickly. So within a week, we could have thousands of data points and make smarter decisions because you have more data available to you. And then the final bit, this is a 
a bit of an orthogonal approach, uh, but that is our orthogonal technology. But in addition to engineering antibodies, my team does computational engineering of antigens. And the, the purpose of this work is to try to see, can we engineer better types of uh, vaccine components? We just won a patent recently on an epitope focusing technology, and we've got some very exciting data from immunizing uh, an epitope focusing influenza vaccine in pigs. Uh, that's that's great. Other people are working on trying to make epitope focusing technologies work. But if you really would like to know whether your vaccine is successfully focusing epitopes, you damn well better have a good technology to tell whether where your where what epitopes are being targeted by your animals. And again, the Cartera platform for me is game changing here because it lets me look at hundreds of clones from the pigs that received my vaccine versus a control vaccine to try to figure out what is the bias of epitopes being targeted at a monoclonal level that are being elicited by my vaccine. So I could get a much higher resolution answer than just do I neutralize against the following viruses? I can ask, is the mechanism true? And I think this is uh, an application area that has been underutilized and is critically needed as we, as we make substantive advances in vaccine science to be able to understand at a molecular level where, where are our immune systems focusing on an immunogen and what is that, uh, how has that changed as we engineer the immunogen towards to try to coerce it to focus on certain sites? Uh, shown here in red is the conserved site on the influenza uh, viral coat protein hemagglutinin that doesn't change every year. And that's really kind of part of our goal is to make a vaccine that could get the immune system to focus on the sites that don't change every year so that you have a single vaccine that protects you for like five years, like a, like a tetanus shot. All right, that's it. This is a team of Distributed Bio. really like to thank Cartera. And at this point, I'm going to wrap up and hand over to Yasmina to describe a bit about how their technology operates. Um, at the end, I can answer some questions. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much to Jake for that amazing presentation and introducing our collaboration together, which is um, something that we're extremely excited about. I'm just going to follow on now. My name is Yasmina Abdish. I'm the CSO at Cartera. I'm going to give you an overview uh, beyond Kinetics of what our platform can do to really help accelerate your antibody discovery. A little bit about the platform, the LSA, um, really that means the Lodestar Array, and the, um, the name is really about helping you to navigate through all of your antibodies um, to really allow you to understand which ones have key properties that are interesting to follow up with. And so the, the premise of the LSA is Array SPR integrated with flow printing. And so we have a system whereby you can either um, print or array up to 384 uh, different clones, let's say. We have a 96 channel print head that can deposit um, a whole batch of clones in one print. We can nest up to four prints to create a 384 array. And then we can toggle to a single flow cell system where you can come in with your antigen and that can flow across the whole surface. And so you can have a one on many type assay which really speeds up the screening process. And so our platform is SPR based and it will support both capture formats and uh, standard amine coupling. So the three applications that uh, we really focus on and that this one on many format is, is um, really well suited to are kinetics, epitope binning, and epitope mapping. So in the kinetics format, as we heard from Jake, that assay we had actually performed on periplasmic extracts. And these were a single chain FCs um, engineered with a V5 tag. And so for the capture there, we would have used an anti-V5 lawn on the surface and capture out the SCFEs um, using our, our print head. And the really cool thing about the print head is that it really focuses onto a spot, uh, a back and forth um, mobility of the SCFE, allows you to really enrich from a very, very low concentration sample. And I saw in one of the questions, someone was asking about why the kinetics were drifting up. And this is really just um, an artifact of the anti-V5 capture surface that we were using. So the reference subtraction for that particular surface wasn't optimal. But actually, we've got much better at using the anti-V5 since um, only a few months of, of work um, with Jake. So 
The next application is epitope binning. And on our array system, we can do a 384 um, comprehensive matrix of um, pairwise um, antibody antibody competitions. This allows you to really build up a picture very, very quickly of where your epitopes lie within the li library, allows you to really kind of survey the landscape within your library. And another application is mapping. And this is where you have an array of peptides that you can put onto the surface. And this could be, for example, a peptide library. And then you can blast through the antibodies in the single flow cell configuration and then you can pick up linear epitopes and really map where those antibodies are binding. So with all these applications together, they provide a real comprehensive um, characterization of your antibody library. So as Jake was mentioning, the epitope focusing that he was mentioning with the uh, flu vaccine, that is something that um, we're really interested in pursuing with our technology as well. So typically we have been really targeting therapeutic antibody drug discovery, where the antibodies themselves are the therapeutic entity. But antibody characterization is also extremely useful when you're using antibodies as probes, as uh, reagents, to really survey an antigenic response to a pathogen. In this regard, you can use the antibody um, information that you'll get from, say, vaccination of pigs, and to better understand what epitopes are being targeted. And then you can use that to inform better designs of vaccines. So really, it's the same assays that we would use if we were characterizing antibodies where the antibody itself is a therapeutic entity. But this is just another really cool application of our technology to inform vaccine design. So I'm going to just show you now um, an example data set where we can collect um, really high quality kinetics on an array of 384 antibodies. In this particular example, I'm going to show um, antibodies that were captured via an anti-human FC lawn, where the capture is much more stable. So the workflow for this would be to print out the antibodies from a supernatant. They don't have to be purified because the anti-human FC is itself uh, an inline uh, purification step. And then once you have spotted all of the antibodies onto the surface, in the single flow cell, you'd come in with the antigen at different concentrations. And then you could get, in parallel, really nice kinetic data on all 384 spots really cool thing about this is that you use a very, very little amount of both your antibodies and your antigen. So in this particular experiment, we were using less than 0.1 micrograms of each antibody. And for the entire assay, we used about two micrograms of antigen. So this is what the data looks like from a single unattended run. And all these data were collected in parallel. So every panel that you see here is a unique spot on the array with an antibody on it. In this particular example, we had fewer than 384 different antibodies, which allowed us to array replicates of the same antibody and then assess spot-to-spot -spot reproducibility, also to explore different surface capacities. And I just wanted to highlight here something in our software, is that the software very, very quickly can pass out all this data and identify the good fits, the bad fits, and the ugly fits. And you can see those um, grayed out or purple sensograms or yellow ones, which where the data wasn't um, good enough quality to justify a kinetic analysis. So now kind of a little bit more um, up close and personal with the sensograms. And you can see that because we had um, replicates of given clones across the array, you can see spot to spot, you're getting really excellent reproducibility. And this allows you within a single experiment to actually report statistics for your kinetics as well. So this really allows you to have a little bit more confidence in the apparent kinetic rate constants that you're reporting. Um, so just a few more sensograms just to show you that we really were able to um, characterize a really wide range of affinities across a single array. And like I said, this was just basically one experiment, very, very simple to set up. 
So another application I wanted to um, touch upon is this mapping where you have peptides arrayed on the surface and you come in with the uh, antibodies. And again, our software is really elegant in that it can very, very quickly analyze these data, come up with the heat map, allow you to present the data in either dendrogram format or a stacked plot format, allowing you very visually to see how the antibodies are clustering into different epitope groups. This is the data from a single experiment where we actually had about 100 analyte uh, antibodies, and then we tested them over a 384 peptide array. And you can see how the blocks kind of pass out, and these are representative of the different epitopes that are being mapped within this set. So uh, the last application I wanted to talk about here is epitope binning. And this is an assay whereby you take two antibodies and you test them for their simultaneous binding to their specific antigen. And you ask the question, can they bind at the same time or uh, it's one blocking the binding of the other? If they bind at the same time, you infer that they're binding non-overlapping epitopes on the specific antigen. And if they cannot bind at the same time, you infer that their epitopes are interfering with one another. And so this scales geometrically, we have a lot of antibodies, and we're able to do this in a 384 format. Um, again, our software is really sophisticated and allows us to very quickly get to the heat map, um, where you can see the green block in the middle is the sandwiching interactions and the red um, down the diagonal shows the blocking interactions. We're then also showing that same information in the terms of a network plot where um, the different bins are clustered together. And we find the network plots to be really intuitive for people. Um, this is an example of a 192 MAB array binning that was just published recently by Ching et al. And um, what was really cool about this data set is that if you layer in um, other information from other assays, you can color the network plots by different parameters. And this allows you to keep the conversation still very epitope centric, but layer in other information. If you wanted to understand your mouse cross reactivity, for example, you can see which clusters are um, showing both human and mouse cross, and which ones are just human specific. And um, say, for example, you had other data, mapping data with subdomains, you can see if the bins are lining up with the subdomains. So one more example of, of how um, adding in orthogonal data really allows you to um, really see more information in your panel of antibodies while keeping a very epitope-centric view of what's going on. I wanted to highlight this paper um, in Nature by um, the Pfizer group, um, authored by Andy Young. And it was very interesting here because we basically did a very agnostic epitope binning experiment several years ago, and we had information of where these antibodies lay in an epitope landscape manner, let's say. And we noticed that uh, when we layered in other data, that we could see that two of the bins were neutralizing bins in a cell-based assay. And then um, we also could layer in information, these were from B cell donors, that each of these bins were actually contributed by actual different people. And then if we looked further, uh, we could see that there was a real germline bias within each of these bins. If we looked at um, mutagenesis mapping, we could see that these bins were actually targeting different parts of the protein. So overall, what we concluded is that um, on, on that project, for, um, this, on this project, we concluded that the two different bins were actually doing a neutralization by a different mechanism of action. We had crystal data to actually support that conclusion. So really, the epitope binning had really helped to guide where the resources were being put for this project. So in summary, I just wanted to say that hopefully I've given you an overview of really the, the power that the LSA platform can provide in helping you accelerate your antibody discovery through a variety of different applications. And our hardware is also supported by really um, very powerful software to allow you to see what's going on very quickly.
So I wanted to acknowledge our great collaborators, Jake at Distributed Bio, Andy at Pfizer, uh, Yingda at Adimab, who provided some samples that, uh, for our reagent panel, and also the folk at Ligon Pharmaceuticals, formerly Crystal Bioscience, and then I just wanted to end uh, with any questions anyone has. We are happy to answer them. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Yasmina and Jacob. We have had quite a few questions come in. The first question, this one's for Jacob. How are the PPE normalized before putting on the Carterra, and is it done with a single concentration? That's one of the things that's pretty convenient about this process. We uh, don't have to do that. We take the colonies, we basically pick colonies, we put them into a one mil induction culture. Our vector is set up such that we have an amber stop that allows our single chain FB to be displayed on phage, but also to be uh, secreted, and it has a MIC and a V5 tag on the single chain FB. So that gets secreted into the PPE. We do a PPE extract. Uh, and then that PP extract is going to be relatively similar concentrations, but there will be variation from uh, from well to well um, due to expression variation of the, the single chain of bees. And then also just subtle effects on a 96 volt plate we often observe. Um, but the, the materials present, we send it over to the, the Cartera instrument. And what happens is the the single chain of bees are captured on the on the the plate or the wafer using the MIC or the V5 tag, and then the analytes are flown over of a known concentration. Um, Yasmina, would you like to add anything to that? But the, the short answer is it's very easy. We don't have to do a bunch of careful normalization, and we're able to work with relatively low concentrations of soluble single chain FBs without having to do any complex reformatting or any irritating work um, right up front. Yeah, basically, as Jake mentioned, the SCFVs have been engineered to have a B5 tag, and so we would lawn that onto the surface and use an anti-V5 antibody to, um, in, in essence, inline purify the SCFV from the periplasmic extract. And using the continuous flow microspotting technology, this allows the um, periplasmic extract in a confined volume of, say, 100 microliters to go back and forth over its spot and really enrich on that anti-V5 capture. So we're able to work with very, very low concentrations, probably lower than 0.1 micrograms per mil, get enough SEFE onto that spot and do 384 independent spots and then come in with the analyte at known concentrations. Thank you both very much. This next question is for you, Yasmina. Does array SPR have more sensitivity than SPR? So SPR is SPR, basically. <laughs> so the array, it depends really who you talk to, um, whether you're talking to a physicist or, or an optics person. The array is really more about how the image is collected um, using uh, CCD cameras. So what we find is that with the array SPR, we're able to get a sensitivity um, plus or minus one response units or so. And with the applications that we're working with right now, which are not small molecules, and we still have to see like what our sensitivity is with small molecules, we're actually getting you know, great, good enough sensitivity to do all the applications pertinent to antibody drug discovery. All right, and we've had several questions come in about supernatants. My next one is, have you tried to screen parental hybridoma supernatant for yeast cultures? If this one is for me, hybridomas, we routinely um, screen the hybridomas using, say, anti-mouse FC capture, as long as there's a capture system that we can use and that the supernatants are provided in a filtered format, they are definitely possible to um, capture onto a surface. All right, and a follow-up question for Jake. Can you use phage supernatant instead of SVFV PPE running array SPR? Sure, so uh, we haven't done that, but we should be able to. We um, have routinely used, in the past, uh, prior to creating the, the amber stop, we've used uh, ELISAs that essentially captured by the tag and held the entire phage particle rather than just a single chain FB. So, uh, Yasmina, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think the same principles would hold true. You'd flow, flow the particles, they would get stuck to the chip, and then again, you'd flow the analyte next. So I don't, I don't see why there would be a mechanistic reason why you couldn't do that. Really, we just would, would 
um, depend how big the particle is. Um, if it's if it's huge, then we would just be limited by the numbers that could physically actually get onto the spot. But if they are, you know, regular like SCFE size or antibody size, then that wouldn't be an issue. But if they were cellular size, that would definitely be an issue. Yeah. So these would be like full viral part. They're basically asking if they can take a phage displayed library that has a single chain FB attached to P3 and the entire phage mid particle or the entire phage particle. And it would still be captured by the, the, the some sort of tag, but the whole particle now would be on the chip. I think that would be rather challenging. And we haven't tried that. And I think that what you would find is that the um, phage mid may be too large and not compatible with the scale of SPR. All right. Good. I'm glad and we have we... the Amber stop then. Okay. We have time for just one more question. We have many more questions that I'll be forwarding on to our presenters for answers via email. But our last question, what tags are compatible with the plates used in LSA? And this is for Yasmina. Pretty much any chemistry can be used as you would on any BLI, ELISA, or or SPR instrument. Um, so the V5 tag was engineered into the SCFE library because it wasn't present in the antigens. So one could use, say, a HIST tag, but then that would also be um, present in the antigens. So the choice of tag oftentimes is, you know, um, driven by expression needs, but also you have to just be cognizant that it's not in the analyte that you want to analyze later. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Yasmina Nubia Abdish of Cartera and Dr. Jacob Glanville of Distributed Bio for your presentations today. Most of all, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent some time with us. We know you've got lots of places to be and lots of things to do, so we're very grateful you chose to spend this time with us. So on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to say thank you so very much and have a great day.